Can you imagine if being bad at Overwatch was a bannable offense? I mean, we all have bad games, bad days, and bad YouTube channels, but just imagine if a slip-up like that could cost you your account. Thankfully, in the world that we live in, just being bad at the game cannot get you banned, and as such, throwing connoisseurs like myself have devised numerous ways of losing their matches. But there is an art to the madness, because the hallmark of throwing an Overwatch is doing so without anybody noticing. It is really easy to tell when something is going wrong in this game, but it's not always that easy to come up with an idea on how to fix it. Since tanks, DPS, and supports all see the game through different lenses, chances are they all perceive the real problem to be something else. Though chances are that I am the problem. If you've been keeping up with my series of ranked videos, you will know that Jeff has placed me in order of magnitude higher than I realistically should be after a 20 season long break from competitive play. Needless to say that competing in a rank that's higher than what you can handle can easily make you the weak link, but we haven't yet discovered if the same is the case for my other roles. Though we did get a bit of a glimpse on our last episode. It is not often any more that things happen in Overwatch that could really tick me off. After having played this game for so many years, you would assume that I've already seen a Torb, but somehow we came across a Torb one trick that found a way. I've never seen a Torbjorn player that managed to get to diamonds solely based on the damage that their turret can provide, but even worse than that was that he thought himself qualified to tell others how to play the game. I've said it twice and I'll say it again, but the worst kind of moron is one that speaks with conviction of a subject they clearly know nothing about, and more so than toxicity, the one thing that really annoys me is stupidity. After 23 agonizing minutes in which I had to witness him feeding his brains out, I eventually snapped and decided to tell him what I really thought about his nonsense. But amidst the chaos that was me arguing with the French Torbjorn was one player whose shenanigans went completely unnoticed. While I was out there trying my hardest to carry on Sigma, a hero that I have very little experience on, my Rotog was out there throwing for content without any of us noticing. Truly, with a shining example like that, I should be able to replicate those results on my final DPS placement. I mean, let's be real here. You be seeing any carry performances from me on heroes that aren't Zenyatta. But if I can get through all five matches without being blamed for a loss, then I consider that a grand victory. And with that out of the way, ladies and gentlemen, our story today takes place on Route 66. Now, just to set the right expectations, I should probably mention that I don't often play DPS, and whenever I do, I have a tendency of playing it like I play support. You'll see what I mean by that in this match, but needless to say that I wouldn't end up being at the top of the scoreboard by the time this is over. But my own lack of competence is not going to be the only problem in this game, because the enemy team featured a player that I knew all too well. Their Fara had been secretly carrying my last game where I was on tank while Tobin and I were bickering, and of course, that meant that he'd be creating a threat that needs to be dealt with. Kicking this game off, my second DPS immediately came in with a big brain play where they made use of the fact that the enemies didn't try to hide their composition, and with that intel on our side, the first pick of the game would be ours. It was very unlike diamonds to be holding so far in the back, but hey, if they don't want to gain any ultimate charge in anticipation of the first teamfight around the corner, then so be it. We continued moving the payload undisturbed, and while I was feeling content with peacefully fulfilling my escorting duties, my loser decided that he needed a bit more action in his life, just that set life wouldn't last very long if he continued playing so aggressively. Speaking of aggression, the enemy tanks eventually decided to join the fight rather than just sitting in the back all game, and since they were running double barrier, things fell apart for us in the flash. My wall bought us some time to get away from their tanks, but my Widowmaker was unable to deal with the Fara, and as much as I was knocking their defensive approach, they sent us packing with very little progress on the objective to show for it. I would lose, so I was trying to get all up in the defender's grill while we were regrouping, but this time I could pull up a wall to save him from suffering the same fate. What I couldn't stop, however, was the enemy Widowmaker going for an absolutely insane grappling hook jump shot, just to then headshot my Widow in the most anti climax way possible. To say that things weren't going great for us would be an understatement. Overwhelmed by having to deal with the Farah as well as an opposing Widow, my second DPS asked our Lucio to swap to something that can provide more sustain for all of that incoming damage. And of course, me running main into that composition wasn't exactly helpful either. Every time I thought I could catch one of the tanks off guard with the wall, they simply walked away from it with a DLC power that was bestowed upon them by Jeff Kaplan himself. My Widowmaker continued losing the 1v1 while we didn't have anywhere near enough damage to do anything against the enemy's double barrier composition. Long story short, it's like every hero on our team was a terrible pick against what the enemies were currently doing to us, whether that was based on playstyle or just sheer character power. Some of us have been more aware of that than others, but either way, all of us were in agreement about something having to change. I think we should swap my... What do you want? I don't know. It's can please. Let's get double shield or something. 
I didn't know at the time that my Lucid was one of the Reddit variety, and I definitely agreed with Mei not being very useful, despite her being my comfort pick. Either way, it seemed that my second DPS needed help dealing with the enemy Farah, and as such, running a second hitscan hero might just be the play. But there is no swap in the DPS category that is going to matter if we aren't given the space to do our job, and as it turned out, our Hammond was merely warming up. It was obvious that none of the enemies have been aware of him still residing in their backline because their Orisa almost got booped off the map as a result of his flank. But McRaka was far from done when it came to messing with their defensive lineup. Nobody likes being booped around as a matter of principle, but when there's also a minefield behind you that limits your movement, that sort of thing can get even more annoying. Most Hammond players would consider this a job well done, but Raka continued to be a backline menace, not only creating space, but stopping the enemy Sigma from using his ultimate. Some people don't believe high elo players when they say that ignoring the pharmacy is a valid strategy, but that's exactly what we decided to do here. It wasn't until we had annihilated their tank line that we gave them any attention at all, and even if we can't eliminate that duo individually, all of us poking them separately meant that they could no longer occupy the sky. Since there were no other defenders left to distract us, Lucio, Hammond, and I decided to be all over that pharmacy duo, and I mean, I knew that the Farah was a good player because I just got out of the match with them having carried me, but since I didn't have to deal with them on my own, we would eventually prevail. The defenders and their meta-abiding composition had shown us no respect up until that moment, but once we had secured the first checkpoint, they had no choice but to back off. But to complete our escort, we still had a long way to go, and you know as well as me that with a composition like ours, we had to rely on our wits more than our characters. Victory on the first checkpoint didn't come easy, but if we can overcome a double barrier comp once, then surely we'll be able to do it again. Our Hammond continued to be a backline nuisance, which meant that the defensive component of this equation wasn't even that much of a big deal. And while he did a great job staying alive, our Tracer dying early into the next engagement would make for a bad omen for our hopes of snowballing to the second point. But I watched enough Metro streams to know that the only right way to play Soldier 76 was by flanking as often and as aggressively as possible. Of course I had to back this up with at least a mediocre amount of aim to solidify my position as a backline threat, but little did I know that the enemy Farah had absolutely no intention of dealing with my nonsense. I mean really, considering how good I know that guy is, getting solo ulted by him was more of a compliment than anything else. Unfortunately, my frontline was not having much more success than me. Frankly speaking, neither defenders nor attackers were showing any amount of cohesion whatsoever, but amidst the chaos, the enemy Zenyatta began fragging out. Despite that man having annihilated vital parts of our composition, our Tracer was not taking him seriously, and as such, they would be turned into yet another statistic. Stick. During scrappy teamfights like these, both teams have to make a decision. Do they want to continue staggering in until one of them comes out victorious, or do they want to go for a full reset? In our case, everybody was determined to be the one who last resides on the payload, and as such, we were in for some non-stop content momentum that couldn't be halted. My Sigma decided to make the swap to Winston, which would be a bold move in and of itself, but looking at his indecisiveness, it seemed as though even he wasn't certain why he made that decision. Some of you guys gave me a hard time for suggesting that Winston is currently the worst tank and arguably the worst character in the game, but witnessing this gameplay really shows why that is. When faced with a DLC tank lineup, there really isn't a lot of space you can create without immediately getting annihilated, and it took not only my Ana's undivided attention, but also every cooldown at her disposal just to keep him alive. There wasn't much anyone could do to help him, because vanilla characters just weren't built to compete with all that utility and damage that we currently had to oppose. Not to mention that my Ana couldn't babysit our Winston 24-7 if she tried, because let's not forget that we still had a very competent Farah to deal with. While my tanks were were trying to secure the front line, Seven was trying to hold his own in the back, and thankfully they successfully kept themselves alive long enough for a Hammond to arrive and deal the final blow. At no point in time did either of our teams decide to pull back, and since both of our spawn points were reasonably far away from the objective, it really only came down to which team could trade two for one first. Vyok was once again demonstrating just how squishy of a tank Winston really is, but thankfully the risk he took was perfectly calculated. And since there was nothing else to worry about but this one choke point, my Ana could keep him alive long enough for them to body block the opposition and secure the second checkpoint. The enemy team was obviously flustered about that failed attempt of a recontest, which gave us an opportunity to try and turn up the heat in order to collect some staggers. But things weren't meant to be so easy, because the enemy Orisa was deleting our tank line with suspiciously robotic precision, though eventually fell victim herself when the reloading of her LMG gave our remaining flankers a brief window of opportunity to take her out. We still hadn't stopped fighting ever since that brawl in the second point, but the enemy McCree was about to try and change that. You see, the thing that sucks about vanilla tanks is that they need to stop protecting their team in order 
order to dish out some damage, whereas DLC tanks can do both of these things at the same time. Why Winston trying to create space with his primal rage meant that he wasn't able to save our support line from the Deadeye. That blow to our lineup was significant enough to finally stop this team fight that had lasted for minutes on end. I was currently stuck on the flank, because of course I was when that faithful play happened, and everyone in our voice chat agreed that we couldn't fight at such a disadvantage. I was taking care of the enemy Farah whenever I could, but if I want to be the deciding factor on this last point, just playing a supporting role is not gonna be enough. The blue team was finally able to set up a proper defense that we couldn't just bust our heads past, and I feel like I'm speaking for my entire team when I say that at this point, that final checkpoint felt very, very distant. Us coming out victorious on the back of very scrappy team fights was speaking for us being superior when it came to individual skill. But when it comes to beating 2 CP style defender biases, it is team play that makes a difference. Team play which we had none to show off. No matter how impressive our individual eliminations were, we couldn't continue to hope for that to carry us to the end when the defenders were obviously displaying an order of magnitude more cohesion than us. Though the enemy McCree was making me doubt my own words when it came to us being superior to them in, well, any way, shape or form. Of course, a staggered elimination like that already put us on the back foot for the impeding last fight, but that wasn't our biggest problem. Much like I learned that playing Hammond into a team that has an Orisa pull, Discord orb, and Fan Hammer combo available makes for a really bad time, our Hammond in this game would engage early despite our calls to wait, and as such, create an insurmountable amount of problems for us as he found himself eliminated by these exact abilities. But whether he was alive or not, we had to get on the objective. Wait, don't go in, what? Fudge. Our attack round would end not only with us failing to capture the last point, but we wouldn't even get to the objective to trigger overtime. As you can imagine, our team was very unhappy about the course this round has taken, and if you think that my Lucio complaining in voice chat was the last we're gonna hear of them, then well, I guess you haven't played a lot of ranked. Now this is one of those moments where I really want to let you guys listen in on voice chat, because I genuinely believe that it would help you understand what I was dealing with in that game. But unlike my own fits of rage, my Lucio had no obligation to keep his rants family friendly, and as such I'm gonna have to ask you to use your own imagination to figure out just how upset he really was. Spoiler alert, he was very upset. Dude, you're just uh, dying every time out of position, it's insane. Yeah, you're flanker, but you, you're also staggering every part. There you go, I got you that one bit of audio in which he didn't use any profanity, you're welcome. As much as he was raising some good points, part of me couldn't help but feel like he was very readily pointing fingers just in order to distract from his own feeding, of which there definitely was plenty. My own verdict on this round was really just that we didn't have any cohesion. The enemy team was playing together while we were trying to brute force our way to victory. I decided to stay really quiet while my supports and voice chat were fighting the rest of our team in text chat, because I knew dang well that I was not contributing as much as I should be. It is very possible that we could have won that round if my individual performance was as good as theirs, but I mean, you guys know me, I'm a team player. Either way, much like my road talk during the last episode, I decided to just try to not attract any attention to the fact that I was definitely contributing to our team's problems. But that doesn't mean that I don't have a plan. I might not be able to create frag montage worthy plays, but if I can keep the enemy far right at bay, that might just be the edge that the rest of my team needed. There was absolutely no shortage of anxiety considering the fact that I was fully aware of the fact that my DPS competence could not realistically measure up to that of the enemies. I would start the round off taking way more damage than is healthy while missing the vast majority of my shots, which put my plan into question already. Vyok would be the only tank I can rely on since our Hammond was out there doing Hammond things, but little did we know that he wouldn't be the center of attention in this first fight. The enemy Farah went for as bold a diving attempt as one can imagine, but Ash's coach gun allowed me to put her in my ideal tracking distance to take her out in a flash. I really wish I could have celebrated that victory, but I hadn't realized that the enemy team was setting up for a dive that went beyond just a pharmacy. Their Genji showed up out of nowhere to take out all of our squishies who were left on low HP following Farah's initial dive bomb, but thankfully our Hammond came back from the spawn to end the madness. As much as we lost half of our team during that initial engagement, simple napkin math can tell you that the only thing worse than losing half of your team is losing your entire team. We succeeded in setting up a defensive position on the payload as our tanks were buying us enough time to return from the spawn. My teammates were well capable of handling themselves, and while the blue team was displaying a much greater level of cohesion, the hallmark of individual skill is being able to identify and exploit enemy misplaced.
cosplays, of which there were many. It sounds like an exaggeration, but my entire game plan literally was just to keep the enemy Farah at bay. And as much as I don't have the greatest aim on this planet, it was good enough to keep sending that message. Losing repeatedly on the first point is going to challenge any team's mental no matter how positive and cooperative they are. It's gotten to the point where they decided to swap from a double barrier to a dive comp, which definitely reeks more of desperation and confidence. I mean, diving itself is not necessarily a bad idea, but what is a Winston supposed to do in the face of our DLC prowess that doesn't even allow him to get on the high ground? You would assume that just changing his target priority to a more isolated target is going to make a difference, but that is not accurate when said target is just another DLC hero. I mean, heck, I actually landed a headshot on him before he hit the ground, which meant that it didn't even wake him up. And while my tracer continued to raise havoc in their backline, all I had to do was continue to combat the enemy Farah, which never got tired of trying to dive me. But again, DLC versus vanilla meant that it would take them much more effort to take me out than the other way around. The blue team failed to make any progress on the objective, no matter how much I decided to change their composition. Our Sigma was actually the only one making proper callouts, while the rest of us were taking our individual matchups to dismantle the attackers. I know that a lot of people believe the DPS role to be all about individual carry performances, but as you can see, I'm nowhere close to delivering hero plays with my only multi-kill in this game coming from Bob. My entire playstyle is always built around supporting my team, and well, sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. But much to my surprise... It worked even in this game. Honestly, I don't even want to show you where I ended up placing because I feel like I'm gonna piss off a lot of people by placing so high despite how very not good I am at DPS. But well, a promise is a promise, so I guess here goes nothing. Yep. I somehow ended up just shy of Masters with my supportive DPS playstyle, which, mind you, is the highest I ever placed on this role. And really, that's all I can say for this episode. I successfully completed all five of my playstyle matches without ever being blamed for a loss, and to me, that is an achievement. I mean, it really helps when you're not toxic in voice chat, which I have to fight not to be sometimes. But either way, I hope you guys enjoyed this episode, and if you did, do let me know by dropping me a like on your way out. Consider subscribing if you want to see more, and definitely ring that bell icon so that you don't miss out on the next episode. I hope you guys have a fantastic day and until next time, peace.